Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and this is part two of my ride with Stefan Bear uh, with the Build the Lanes channel here on YouTube, as well as a traffic advisor for the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. Uh, Stefan was in town visiting some friends, and he wanted to see some of the Dutch-inspired cycle network that the city of Austin has been developing over the last decade or so uh, with a partnership with the Dutch Cycling Embassy see and and really it's i hope you will agree that it is an inspiration for many cities around the globe and north america that safer more all ages and abilities facilities uh, can be created what we're going to see here in part two uh, we're going to start off in in some really nice sections here right along fourth street just outside of the downtown area you can see on the left here is the plaza saltillo neighborhood the development that has been built and uh, there's some really good stuff in there but but we're also gonna see some rough stuff that's still in development. So off to the left, uh, you see we've got some nice multi-family, uh, multi-use facilities here. You got a Target and a Whole Foods market in that building right to the left. Yeah. To the right, we've got uh, metal recycling. So we've got an industrial kind of old school place that'll eventually sell and get redeveloped. But if you turn, turn around and you take a look at what we're rolling away from. It's like, yeah, that's the downtown. And this is where a lot of young professionals are now moving to. Yeah, yeah. Then I can see the, the, the yuppie, you have all the yuppie housing on the left. Yeah. The five, the five by ones, five over ones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the concrete is interesting though. At least you have a contrast. Yeah. So this particular spot here, this is all gonna be redeveloped. A new station? This station's gonna get redeveloped. Hence the reason why this just kind of dumps you into this little mixing zone here. Up ahead. It's like a, 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 a Texas cycle street. Yeah, it's a local <laughs> up ahead. Town. Uh, is a little alleyway which continues on the trail, but we're going to turn left here at this street. All right. Yeah. Well, you lead the way. Yeah. All right, we're going to turn right here. Again, all of this is pretty much brand new in the last five years. Yeah. Yeah, so this reminds me of a proper street. I mean, we're in the middle, but it still feels quite comfortable. Yeah. Because it's low speed. Yeah. And that's a point I want to make to maybe anyone who's watching is that it's the, it's the type of car traffic present that necessitates the need for infrastructure. So if you have a very low car traffic zone, low speed zone, then it's an open space for everybody. You don't need a separated bike path. Yeah. For instance. Yeah. So. And something I see quite often is sometimes advocates like to start by putting bike paths on the really slow streets because they figure it's easy there. Right. But it's probably not doing too much in the long run. We're gonna turn left up here. So we're next to, what's the name of this road right here? This is Chicon. Chicon. So this is also um, a challenge issue with a lot of American roads is because they put in a bike lane, bike path right here. And what this is actually reminding me of is this is reminding me of the city of Antwerp in Belgium. And Belgium gets a lot of crap sometimes for being like a less well-planned version of the Netherlands. And the reason I point this out is because we have this bike path here, but 
we have constant driveways that are intersecting this bike path. So maybe if you can get a shot of this road behind us, you know, if you're crossing a driveway every 50 feet, you have a separated bike path, but you're still getting this T-bone conflict that still exposes you quite a lot. So the only way you can really fix this is if you have lots of entrances and exits is if you were to turn this from a road into a street where it's then safe to cycle down the middle of it. So that's, a, that's I think that's one challenge that a lot of American cities face is that they have these roads with lots of entrances and exits and they start with the bike path, but it's still quite problematic because it's still quite dangerous because you have a T-bone conflict still to handle, yeah. but you've removed the parallel conflict. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like this is a relatively new treatment. Um, so this is recently redone. Yeah. If you look to the other side of the street, you'll notice the, uh, there's no bike lane on the other side of the street. That's because they completely redid that whole curb and brought the curb in and turned that into a shared use path. And so that is shared space over there, bikes and peds, knowing that the majority of the confident cyclists are probably just gonna take the lane and go with the motor vehicles. But because this campus right here, and we've got a person in a wheelchair motoring down, um, that campus that we see right there, that's a university. That's actually a college right there. And so um, one of the things that they wanted to do is try to really make that pedestrian slash bike realm a little bit safer, at least on that side of the street. Um, and, and so it, it's definitely improved from where it was before, which where it was before it was just a painted bike lane only on each side of the street and an undersized and broken up sidewalk. And so, I get what you're saying on that, yeah, for sure. Um, and what we're seeing here is literally 2.0. Yeah, it's, it's, it's growing yeah. pains, and yeah. you won't be able to fix this until you take it from the network approach. Because right. if you think about like an inverted pyramid, you've got land development on the top, yeah. then you've got the network planning, then you have the, the, ge the local geometry, yeah. then traffic control, law enforcement, and then personal actions all the way on the bottom. So. As, you, as your city planners get more confidence and experience, they start moving up that ladder a bit more to think about the land development and then the network routing. So maybe one day turn this from a road into a street. Well, and, and, and to your point too, oftentimes it's not even the, the, the confidence of those designers and city planners, it's actually the tolerance of the politicians and the community to accept those designs. That believe me, those designers were, are more than competent for doing that right now today. What we don't have is the, the political will and the community will necessarily to take it that fast. Yes, that's well put. Yes, yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, let's go. In fact, here we can see the old treatment. So now we're back to just the painted bike lane on each side and gutter lane and, uh, and then the old sidewalk on the other side there. And that's also another thing is uh, in the Netherlands, in the urbanized space, the, the favorite approach is one bike lane on each side. And the reason they want to do that is because your destinations are going to be on both sides of the road, so they want to make it safe to access, and they don't want to have to make it where you have to turn across the road to reach your destination every single time. Right. However, when you're in the rural area, because you're going to be next to a, you know, a very high-speed road, they don't want people crossing over that at all. And because there's often so few destinations along those rural routes, then they opt for a two-way uh, bike path. But of course, there's always exceptions here and there based on what the spatial constraints are. Right. Ah, we got the... So, I don't know if you remember it a long time ago, uh, Vignesh posted a video on TikTok and something he designed, which I really liked, is that he made the, the buffer a spot for the trash pickup zone. So instead of having this where the, um, the garbage truck is in the gutter, they would, make, they, they would just make this buffer just a teeny bit wider and it would be wide enough to then put it there. Right. And then you don't have any kinds, kinds of things like this. Yeah. Like, I, Yeah, I think that's brilliant is, you know, if you've got enough real estate, just a little bit more so it can accommodate the, uh, the trash bins. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, the, the minimum width for a lane for a road is, 
uh, where I'm where I work is around just under 11 feet. So yeah, if this is a 12 foot lane, if I'm correct, then bump that down to 11. Yeah, you got the space there. Let's go ahead and turn left here. Okay. Well, there's your bearing. You can see a semi there. I think it's a little narrower than 11. Yeah, that's which. I applaud, you know, the designers. Good job. Yeah. Good job, guys. You got that nice and narrow, and we see with that very, very wide load, and this is a wide load. It's a semi tractor with a wide load tractor on the back bed. And yeah, he's able to navigate it just fine. All right. I'm from California, I'm spoiled. I, I'm used to protected lefts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyways, that's a, that's a, a, a recent uh, application, a recent uh, build, quick build materials, obviously, put it out there, give the community a chance to respond to it. Uh, thoughts from your perspective of having both uh, experience in North America as well as now in the Netherlands. Yeah, so quick build I think is kind of like the uh, version 0.0 .0 where you want to do a lot of things very quickly and you want to get the community used to it. So yeah, for, in terms of quick build, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, I would say very, very good. Swing the camera around here yeah. and we see we've also got uh, a new crossing that was put in. So again, this when whenever we see the improved pedestrian crossings and the improved ADA yes. ramps there, we know that that's not necessarily quick build. That's yeah. that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Exactly. <laughs> so I think that actually, so when it comes to design, I think you have to treat quick build a bit differently than concrete because the whole point of the quick build is to experiment, to deploy it quickly. Um, quite often I see cities make a mistake with quick build where they want to do a quick build project, but then they put it out to the typical project acquisition process where they put it out to bid and then a private company has to bid on it and then it gets done by a contractor, which completely misses the point of quick build because you have just made a quick build project that's going to take two years to deploy. Right. The cities themselves are supposed to be doing it and deploying it to figure out what they want. So when they want to put in concrete, they can then go to a contractor and a design firm to say, okay, well, this is all the data we've gathered. Yeah. Now please put in the concrete and the asphalt. So I'm, when it comes to the design itself, a quick build, yeah. I'm more concerned about the timeline of it. That's the most yeah. important part of it for me. Get it out there quick. Exactly. Just, just like how San Jose did when they redid 20 or 30 protected intersections like that. Yeah. And now, and the, the best part about it is that there's so much data now on protected intersections because they have these 20 or 30 working in downtown and they know it works now. So yeah. because in North America, they say, well, do you have a previous example you can cite? We have 20 examples of cite yeah. as far back as like five or six years ago. <laughs> right. So, fantastic. And again, a lot of this is trying to gingerly <laughs> get the community, get the residents used to slowing down when they pile into their cars and go. Yeah. <laughs> because honestly, if you ask them, they'll, they'll say that that's what they want, is the motor vehicles to be driving slower. So yeah, how, how is it the projects received here? Because mm -hmm. I, no matter where you work in the world, there's always a loud minority of people who don't like it. But even in the case of Harlem, I would say 50% of people are impartial. They have no opinion yeah. on it. They're just like, oh, okay, the city's gonna do yeah. what the city's gonna do. Quarter are, are enthusiastically for it and a quarter are, yeah against it, well, how is it? Same, it's the same, yeah. It's no different. I, I think that's universal at this point in time. Yeah. You, you're, you're definitely not ready as a community if you get you know, way more vocal, adamant opposition. Okay, here's, here's the uh, odd intersection, the odd angles, and we're gonna be angling straight across, and we see this little treatment that's underway here. Okay. Let's go ahead and stop and chat about this. 
This is the odd angled. This is the, the street that's coming in at an oh, odd it's angle. Askew, it's askew. Yeah. So yeah, and then of course this is the street that I was telling you where we've got you know the the relatively quick build uh, protected bike lanes along this stretch here on this uh, three lane road. We've got two travel lanes in the center turn lane. Uh, a lot of concrete work here. This is a little mixing zone for the transit uh, and all that. It's not a super high traffic area in the sense of lots and lots of, of peds and lots and lots of, of people on bikes, but at the same time, there was a little bit of challenge of finding space for everybody and also trying to bring motor vehicle speeds down while taking a travel lane away. <laughs> well, the best part I like about this is that this approach, the most important part of the uh, Dutch protected intersection is that you have the protected right turn here. Yeah. Because when it comes to going straight or turning left, you can deal with that with uh, the traffic signal programming even. So the most important infrastructure part is the protected right here. Yeah. Now on that side, I'm gonna guess that the, this part hasn't really been done yet. If you, want to, if you need to cross from here over to here. But this side of the intersection, uh, in terms of having to do work very quickly, yeah, in fact, let's walk over there and let's, sh let's check this out. So over here, it's a sense it is complicated. Um, you know, when we get over to this side, we see that it also um, had a, a interesting niggle. So down that way, they came up onto um, the, the sidewalk level and then come up to here. And then if you are heading this direction, then you come through here and then you make your way across. And if you're heading that direction, you have an uninterrupted at the sidewalk level on the shared use path going up, up in this area here. Uh, you can see how they have the, the truck apron. Yeah. Uh, right here where they use the, the bricks, I can see that they've tried to tighten the turn. But I have a question yeah. for you. Do you know why they kept the slip lane open instead of making cars turn right around here? So maybe bringing this island inside a little bit? Because I understand if you have a truck, you need to have maybe a wider turn here. Uh, is, is this just because this is a quick build project and they have the limited budget they're working with? I would say this isn't quick build, just looking at the, the amount of concrete that got poured on this. Yeah. I would say that it was probably more of an indication, and I'm just speculating here, um, at the angle, that odd angle that they were at, uh, that to your point, an 18-wheeler probably was gonna have a lot of difficulty making that corner. I mean, I would have probably, if I was like had my druthers and I would put my Dutch design hat on, yeah. I might look at, you know, hey, do we really need to prioritize that, that fast road? Can yeah. we bring that down? Maybe this is a, 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 a roundabout of some sort or some sort of uh, yeah. uh, intersection that can handle this sort of complexity, you know, and at the same time just encourage slow speeds and, and not have to deal with that. Yeah, I always need to pop on my Google, Google Maps when I have to look at the routing. If I'm just purely focused on the geometry, I would probably have closed this off here mm -hmm. and maybe just taken this little island and brought it in a little bit this way. Yeah. That way the trucks can still make that turn. Yeah. We have this protected right turn. Yeah. And then, at least on this side of the intersection, then we can then program out all of the conflicts between the bicycles and the cars. Yeah. And then, and not even talking about that side of the intersection yet, but I'm gonna guess that was outside the scope of the project. Yeah. And who knows, the scope of the project might have been such that too, the, the amount of money for, <laughs> for redesigning it might have been like, yeah, that pole's not moving. <laughs> exactly, and that's, that, that's one problem with projects in the US is that there's a lot of strings attached, yeah. especially with the funding where the designers know something's a better idea, yeah. but just the way the project is funded, the choices between, well, you can do your better idea and lose yeah. funding, yeah. or take the money and then implement the worst idea. Yeah. So a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of times designers here don't have full creative freedom and flexibility in cases yeah. where they could really use it. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes they're just moving so fast too. It's just like, hey, yeah. we need to get stuff down. And you know, by the way, the main thing here is get this, you know, uh, quasi protected bike lane in. And oh, by the way, we got to figure out this fricking intersection because it's a it's a monster. <laughs> yeah, and that's also why. No, that's a great point, and that's also one reason why I tell people, don't try to make your design too Dutch because. It took, it's gonna take you, if you wanna do it completely Dutch, it'll take you 40 years because the Dutch don't rebuild a street until it's time to redo the utilities. Yeah. So the Dutch approach is very gradual. Yeah. And if you want to do something, a lot of work very quickly, 
you want to adopt a different model. So I tell people look at Paris because yeah, yeah. Paris is doing a ton of work. Yeah, they're moving quick. Yeah. yeah, and as time goes on, they'll iron out the pain points. Yeah. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. This is the end of part two of my ride with Stefan Bear on up to the Mueller development to check out uh, the really Dutch inspired cycle network that has been built up there. Uh, I hope you stay tuned for part three, which will be coming up soon. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>